Eight weeks ago, we began a, a journey together on what it looked like to understand what a stronger marriage is and grow in our ability to build stronger marriages or prepare to be in a stronger marriage if we're not married. And I began uh, our time talking about the fact that, that marriage is God's idea, and therefore there's a 100% chance of it being successful if you do it God's way because he has designed it to work certain ways and not work certain ways. So God made it, which means it's good. There's a 100% chance that it works if you live out God's design. And then we've spent the last seven weeks looking at that design. I begin our time with a list, and I want to re return to that, that list because that list is going to set up where we're going to go today in our last installment of Stronger Marriage. And this was a list. The nine alternatives to a stronger marriage, because I realize that a stronger marriage isn't the given. That's not what we'll fall into. There are alternatives to a stronger marriage, and I noted some of them here. There's the stuck marriage, just can't make any progress. There's the stale marriage, there's just no life. There's the sick marriage, always just kind of never able to get strong. The immune system is weak, and like something drifts by in the wind, and boom, you pick up a cold. Like there's mold in the house, and you just can't get healthy. There's the shallow marriage, really busy, highly productive, just an inch deep. There's the stressed marriage. The, the, the atmosphere of the home is one of anxiety and tension and stress. There's no peace. There's the selfish marriage made up of one or two takers who are there to get what they can from the other rather than serve the other with the strength that God supplied. There's the sexless marriage. There's the struggle bus marriage. We can just never seem to get going here. Or there's the singles marriage. Two independent, separate people living together under the same roof. All of those are, are alternatives to what God would have for us in a stronger marriage. And so we started there, and I said, some of you have maybe been in some of these marriages or are currently in a marriage like this or may one day be in this marriage, and these laws are how you claw your way out. And so we began then taking a look at the, the seven irrefutable laws of a stronger marriage and that you cannot violate these laws and the plane of your marriage fly, like gravity, like aeronautics, like, like, like this, these, or aerodynamics, these laws are in place and they're just there in the universe that God's made, and you're living in a reality that he has made, which you can't violate. So you can't violate the law of preeminence or law of promise in your marriage flourish. And so we walked through each of these laws one by one. The law of preeminence, Christ over spouse. The law of promise, come hell or high water, I stay. The law of priority, I pursue you for a lifetime. The law of his power, I'll wield my masculinity for good. The law of her power, I'll wield my femininity for good. The law of marriage, or the law of pleasure, God made marriage to burn hot. And the law of planning that I said last week was the most important law that I'm going to undermine myself by today saying today's law is the most important, but last week was important. And, and it stands as, as such because if you have the first six but not the seventh, it won't work. In other words, you won't have a stronger marriage because you know more about a stronger marriage. You'll have a stronger marriage when you actually start acting and exercising the laws that make your marriage stronger. So if you know about the law of priority or the law of my, my power as a man or the law of promise, but you don't have a plan to actively apply it, it won't do you any good. That knowledge won't help make your marriage stronger unless you make a plan to apply it. So, okay, the law of preeminence, Christ over spouse. I need to make a plan to make sure I live that law out as a reality, the law of priority. I need to make sure my wife feels my pursuit or my husband feels my pursuit. If I don't make a plan for it, it won't happen and it won't do me any good. So if you don't have a, uh, you need to make good plans, have holy ambitions for your current marriage or your future marriage so that you live in such a way as to engage the power of the laws. But having said all of that, the biggest question I've been getting in the last several weeks from, from many of you is, that's great, now what? Like, this would have been great to know 30 years ago. You know, where were you 30 years ago? Like, I was 12. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, like... I was on you to find somebody else. I couldn't help you at the time. I was like playing army in the woods in Leavenworth with my brother. <laughs> but I get it. It's like somewhere like, hey, we're 5, 10, 15, 20 years in, and oh, if we would have known these sooner, and there's a, there's, there's a sense of excitement for the future, but some, there's a sense of regret for what's been wasted in the past. And I'm here to tell you that we have hope as Christians because God can redeem the years that you gave to the locust. That's an actual Bible verse in the Bible. 
Meaning you left a field fallow for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, no fruit of righteousness, no fruit of godliness. You were ignorant and lazy in your farming practices. And then God can come back and restore 20 fold the years that you left to the locusts by giving you a harvest that makes up for all the years that you lost. That's a possibility in the grace of God. Amen. So this is exciting. This is, this is encouraging. This is like, oh, there is hope. And it can be hard sometimes to know where to start. So if you're like, okay, this has been great. This is now good to know. I now realize all the things I've done wrong. What do I do now? That's where the eighth law is coming into play. And it's this law that's the most important because if you don't engage this law, it won't matter how many notes you take or how many podcasts you listen to or how much therapy you go to, your marriage will not get stronger. It's a basic tenet of Christianity and it's right at the foundation of discipleship and yet I find that we rarely think about it in relationship to our marriage. So I want to take this, this, this kind of general Christian principle and I want to pull it into the context of marriage. So the eighth law of a stronger marriage is you need the law of God's power engaged in your marriage. And I say God's power because if you try to engage the law of preeminence or the law of promise or the law of priority or the law of his or her power or the law of pleasure or law of planning, if you try to engage those without engaging the law of the, of the power of God, you'll be attempting to do those things in your own strength and you won't make much progress. What you need more than anything is you need the power of God at work in your marriage. You need it more than you need a counselor. You need it more than you need a therapist. You need it more than you need our next podcast episode. You need the power of God, the active present power of heaven being poured out in your life. Amen. I'm getting there because, yeah, you can thank the Lord for that too. I'm getting there because as I've listened to the questions coming in and as I've read, we, we've gotten so many questions. I'm so honored by your questions. You're thinking well. You're wrestling with difficult things. And Sharon and I, it's a sacred trust to be asked these questions. And we ask the Lord to help us be helpful. And we hope that we are. We've got over 100 questions. We've answered like 24 or something like that or 30. And so we're going to continue recording um, a podcast in, in an effort, endeavor just to help serve as many folks as we can, if that's serving you well. But as I've read these questions, I have had the thought, you know, uh, so-and-so, and then she did this, and such and such, and this happened. And I get down through this question, I'm like, oh, dear Lord. I, I don't know. I don't know how to answer this question. And the more I've reflected on the questions that are asked, and the more I've reflected on the situations that people find themselves in, the more I'm convinced that what people need more than anything else is the power of God, the raw, unadulterated, plugged into the source power of God in their life. If the power of God was at work in their individual life, and then they brought that power to their marriage, game changer. So the question I'm going to ask us today is, how do we activate the power of God in our marriage? We state as such, stronger marriage law number eight, the law of God's power is simply this, Christ in you. The law of God's power, Christ in you. The law defined in a sentence, God gives us his power to live a redeemed life, overcoming sin, brokenness, addiction, pain, heartache, bondage, and generational curses. I'll stop there, and I'll make this note. Many of the questions are coming from people who are excited and looking forward to working on building a stronger marriage and looking for practical how-tos because they didn't have a picture of a stronger marriage to work from as a framework growing up uh, as a child. And some of the questions are coming from deep places of brokenness and pain, not even so much asking for help as they are asking for hope. They're like, they're like I don't even know where we'd start. I just want to know, should we start? I'm not quite sure what we would even do. I just want to know if we should even try. Is there hope for our marriage? To which the resounding answer from heaven that I hope you hear this morning is, 
Yes and amen in Christ. There is hope for your broken marriage. There is hope for your your current bondage to addiction. There is healing for your pain. There is strength for your weakness. If not, you listen to one more podcast. Not if you take one more notes off my stupid slides, but if you tap into the power of God. Now, I'll caveat it. Means of grace. Podcasts are good and take notes and study. Yes, all this stuff. Okay, all this stuff. I'm trying to make a point. You might not need one more book. You will always need the power of God. You might not need one more sermon. You will always need the power of God. More caveats. Books are good. Sermons are great. I do it for a living. So you know what I mean? You get what I'm saying, right? What we need. There are men in this church who have no business having a strong marriage like they do. And they have no business having a strong family like they do. And I look at them and I go, how did they get there? And there's only one answer. The power of God to save. You may have challenges in your... I listed generational curses here. Because you may have challenges in your marriage that are coming from generational curses of sin done above you that you haven't considered. And you need to wake up and you need to consider what's above you to make sure it's not getting on you. Because if what's above you is not godly, it's demonic. And you need to ask yourself, have I built a shelter that's strong enough or have I created enough distance so that we're far enough away so that demonic toxicity doesn't drip into my heart or our marriage or, God forbid, my household and ruin us for the next generation? You're like, what do you mean? This is what I mean. I've said this before. I'll say it again. I have rarely, if ever, and and I'd have to dig back through my kind of notes, but, and I checked with my dad, dad between services, and and to our recollection, my dad, almost 40,000 hours in crisis counseling situations, and my experience, 25 years in pastoral ministry, I have yet to find a single man addicted and bound to pornography who we do not find out later is struggling with the same thing his dad did before him. That's a fact. Not to say that a man can't start his own sin tree, okay? But by and large, men who wrestle with this come to find out later they're wrestling with a demon that had their dad by the throat for 30 years. Which means, men, the dragons you're fighting now matter because if you don't get them out of your living room, they'll kill your children. If you don't eradicate them from your family line, they will be in your family line generation upon generation until God raises up a warrior to say enough who downloads the power of heaven with the sword of the spirit and Christ in them, the hope of glory, goes to war against dragons who've been killing your family for generations. It might be that your marriage isn't strong because there's sin above you that you have yet to identify or deal with. That takes a man It takes courage. It takes strength for a wife to go, you know what? My family line here has some brokenness in it. And maybe my mom and dad are trying. Maybe they aren't. but, but, But I need to let them figure that out. And I need to take about four big steps back. There is hope for your marriage, whether it be future or present, to grow strong. But not if you play around with addiction. And not if you enjoy bondage. And not if you feed dragons rather than slay them. And certainly not if you're unaware of generational curses above you and fail to deal with them in the blood of Jesus. So the law of God's power to find. God gives us the power to live a redeemed life, overcoming all of that list so that any marriage, this is what I want you to hear. You're watching online. You're camping somewhere this weekend. You're here in the room. You're watching this a year from now. Any marriage can experience redemption, wholeness, and holy happiness. Any marriage. The further you think your marriage is away from experiencing that reality, the more glory God is about to get for redeeming your marriage should you step into his grace. There's not a single marriage that God's walked up to and go, beyond repair. I mean, I know I made the universe 
but this one will be tough to fix. There's not a marriage that God has walked. It's like, no, no. He can restore, redeem, revive, bring back from the dead any marriage. The question is, do you want it? Because what I'm going to get to today will hopefully potentially reveal in your heart that the reason you don't have a stronger marriage is because you don't want one. There are many wives that would give verbal agreement to, oh yeah, we want a Christian marriage, but with their actions that we'll get to, they demonstrate, I don't really want one. I would rather have the marriage that I have, dysfunctional, but me in control. Or vice versa with a husband to a wife. So it's not that a stronger marriage is impossible, but a stronger marriage must be wanted. So the question on the table for us to answer is, how, how do we activate the power of God in our marriages? Now I'm going to deliver on a promise, and that promise was I was going to bring my dad in to speak on this issue. So please give a warm welcome to my dad who's going to finish this sermon, okay? <laughs> Just kidding, he's not coming. <laughs> but I'm going to talk as if he was here. So from here on out, it's Greg in a 45-year-old little taller body, okay? <laughs> it's a little taller version of Greg. And quite honestly, almost every sermon is like that because I'm only, I'm just teaching and preaching what I was taught by my mom and my dad and the Holy Spirit. Okay? So from here on out, this is all my dad. Are you ready? This is the, the Greg secret sauce. Many of you are like, is, is Greg still counseling? I wish he would. No, he's not. He, he's, he's, we've retired him. He's trying to be a grandpa and our staff chaplain. So stop sneaking out to his, his trailer like I don't see your car parked out there and meeting with him. Knock it off, okay? He's busy. He's getting old, and I need him at home mowing my lawn. That's another conversation. <laughs> the point being is I'm going to give you what he would give you if you went out there, okay? So I'll save you the four hours and the whiteboard mind melt session, and I'm just going to tell you exactly what he would say. If you've spent more than three seconds with my dad, he has worked these next four words into the conversation. If you went to my dad for a broken marriage or a rolled ankle, he would tell you these things, okay? This is his go-to stuff. The Greg secret sauce is God's principles, which we've been studying for the last seven weeks, the law of preeminence, the law of promise, the law of priority. Those are the principles of God. Those are the laws that God's put in place, right? But if you know my dad, it's not just God's principles. Finish it. It's what? Christ's character, okay? It's principles and character. Two wings on a plane, Josh. Two pedals on a bike, Josh. Principles and character. Principles and character. I'm like, wah, 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 wah. I'm like, Dad, I'm seven. I get it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this, is, this is my life. And the older I get, the more profound it becomes. What dad's saying is, it's not enough to know God's principles. Are you employing them and deploying them in the character of the one whom God sent to put on display the perfection of his principles, namely his son Jesus? So it's not just God's word, it's God's way in my dad's language. So it's not enough to know that, the, yeah, we got one fan in the balcony, yay, he's like, yay. It's not just enough to know that, you know, the law of promise is important and, 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 and we, should, we should protect the covenant. It's how are you going to now embody that in the character of Christ? It's not enough to know the law of priority where I pursue my wife. No, no. How do I do that? It's not enough to know I'm supposed to be a strong man. If you're living out the principle of headship in the, in the character of your flesh, it won't go well. So if you're trying to be the head, that's a principle. With the attitudes of your flesh, selfish, bombastic, heavy-handed, it doesn't work. You don't activate the power. Is this making sense? You need the principles of God delivered through the character of Christ. That's like my dad's life, like that's his hit song. That's my dad's life message. You just, you just heard it. I saved you four hours in the trailer right there. <laughs> Step two of the Greg's secret sauce, and it'll take you a lifetime to work that out, by the way. Because you need to memorize, soak in, meditate, study, reflect upon the principles of God, and then you need to repent and grow and walk in the Spirit to increasingly reflect the character of Christ, or you're dead in the water. This is simple. It's not simplistic. 
This is simple and profound in that it will take a lifetime of repentance and humility to work this out. And here's the promise. It only gets sweeter as you go. The man who has beat the drum of principles and character, principles and character, principles and character is not chewing gravel at the end of his life. He's benefiting and reaping the sweetness that comes, the beauty that comes from a life dedicated to living out these things. Study, read, know, meditate, saturate your mind with the principles of God, and then walk in the power of the Spirit and ask for his help to display the attitudes of Christ. That kind of life bears good fruit in your marriage, in your kids, in your grandkids' life, and in the lives they're impacting for generations. It wouldn't hurt Western civilization to have a hundred Gregs come out of this church or a thousand Greg and Candies to come out of this church or 10,000 generationally who are committed to knowing the principles of God and living out the character of Christ. We could close his trailer down and you could do it now. But if you somehow got out to dad's trailer without me knowing and he had more than three seconds to talk to you, he would tell you what I'm going to tell you next. So you don't need to talk to you anymore. This is what he would give you. I'm telling you, wrecked, wrecked marriage or rolled ankle, he's getting this on the whiteboard. Like this is going to come out on, on a napkin, on a piece of paper, or on your forehead if he needs to. He's going to draw this picture. If you want to activate the power of God in your life through his principles, you have to have these four fundamental Christ-like character qualities in your life. The first, Josh, is integrity. Got to have integrity. Meaning what you do matches what you say. And what you say aligns with what you do in the future. Meaning who you are is an integrated whole. You don't say one thing and do another. If you continually say, hey, baby, I'll do the dishes. Hey, I'll knock out that laundry. Hey, I'll be home for a date night. And then never follow through on that. It's not as if you're, you're committing this heinous sin against your spouse. You're just lowering the value of your incredibility of your integrity. And if that keeps going, danger. You, you, you will red pin your marriage. If you live integrity, the fruit, because, because actions and attitudes always bear fruit, right? That's old dad's thing, like attitudes bear fruit. So what's the fruit of integrity? The fruit of integrity is trust. If you're a person of integrity, you're someone who can be trusted. And if you're someone who can be trusted, you're someone who someone else can have a relationship with. Because here's the reality. If you don't have integrity, you're not trustworthy and you're incapable of having relationships because trust is the currency on which relationships live or die. The opposite of integrity is, of course, deception. And the fruit that that bears, upside down, broken fruit, uh, uh, black fruit, it's broken trust. So, So integrity is my life is open. I have nothing to hide. You can access my phone. You can ask me any question you want. I, I, I am endeavoring to walk in the light as much as it depends on me. My life is open. The, la- the opposite of integrity is my life is closed. I don't want you to see who I really am or what I really think or what I say when you're not around. I don't want you to see into the closets that I have closed and locked and only know what's in there. I'm deceptive. I'm covert. I'm not overt. And now the, the, the fruit of that kind of life is one of broken trust. There's no relationship, whether it's a husband to a wife or a brother to a sister or a friend to a to a friend or a coworker, to a boss. There's no relationship that works where trust is regularly violated and broken. So that's the first corner of the relationship success model that I'm giving to you right now that I first heard when I was 10 at the Presbyterian Church and Dad was doing like seven-week lectures and I was there taking notes in the back row. The second after integrity is honor, meaning there is no relationship that will thrive where dishonor is the regular discord, discourse, rather, that brings discord. (laughs) The fruit of honor in relationships is one of value and love. So take this in your marriage. When I honor my wife publicly, I make her feel valued and loved. And when I honor her privately, I make her feel valued and loved. And when she feels valued and loved, she opens her heart to me. When my wife honors me publicly, when she honors me privately, I feel valued and loved by my wife. I feel prioritized by my wife, and I I can't help but find myself opening up to her. Even if I want to stay closed off, when she's just shelling me 
with round after round of honor and respect. I, just, I can't help it. Oh, my heart is open to you. I love you. The human heart can't resist being respected and honored. It makes them feel loved and cherished and valued. Of course, the opposite of honor is disrespect. And the fruit of disrespect is I feel unloved and the relationship grows cold. There's no universe that exists where a relationship that exchanges between a husband and wife, disrespect and dishonor, grows in its warmth and love. And maybe this is just me getting, this works in, in your family too, and this is just probably me getting old because I'm 45 and cantankerous, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's okay because I, I go, it's kids these days, is it just me? Is it just me? I, I go to these track meets and I just want to choke all these little rats running around. I mean, we'll put that on the internet. And I mean, it's just it's, it's like, Mega church pastor wants to choke kids. Kind of. I mean, I'm there. I'm, 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 like, I'm like, unbelievable amounts of disrespect just radiating off these little rascals running around. And it's not cute. It's terrifying. Because one day that kid's going to have another 100 pounds on him and a car. It's like, we got to get, I mean, like they walk up and they just blow disrespect at their mom or at their dad or at a coach. And I just want to go, you're 12, you little pipsqueak. You little worm, you little goober, you will stand and salute. In my presence, I'm 45, I have a mortgage, more money than you, and responsibility. And I require a little respect in my presence. That's how I feel. I mean, I just don't do well out in public anymore. Oh, my goodness. It's wild. And we're not helping anyone by letting them get away with it. And then we go home and disrespect our spouse, and we get away with it all day long. It's like, here's the deal. No relationship thrives. If you allow a 12-year-old kid to be like that with his friends, he'll be like that with his spouse. That's why it matters. You, you got to get on that little rat now. <laughs> Otherwise, he'll develop relational habits. And the habit is just punch and punchline and poke and stick and laugh and demean. And no, no, no. That's toxic to a relationship. And so you, in your marriage, if you're not honoring the other one, don't plan on growing the fruit of love and value. The third critical character quality is that of forgiveness. Meaning, if you're going to have healthy relationships, you need to be someone who is um, uneasily offendable. Like, like, is not easily offended. And you need to be someone who is quick to forgive. Quick to forgive. This is a virtue and a character quality of Jesus Christ. It didn't, think, think about it. When I say you need to be quick to forgive as, as, as an expression of the character of Christ, how many years or decades did it take for Jesus to forgive those who crucified him? It took him like three seconds. On the cross, not even dead yet, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The fruit of forgiveness is healing. Because what, what we know to be true is that if you're married to another human being, the only guarantee is that you will be sinned against and you will sin against. Like that's, that's the only given in that relationship. There's no marriage that's ever like, I was a selfish, dirty, rotten sinner, and then we got married, and I've stopped sinning. That doesn't happen. If anything, who you were gets magnified in your marriage. So if you're a dirty, rotten, selfish sinner before you get married, my goodness sakes, marriage like a magnifying glass will only expose that to the world. And so it's important to prepare for that moment now if you're not married by working at mortifying the sins of the flesh because you think, I'm going to play now and be responsible later, that calculus never works. And so when we forgive, what we're doing is we're, we're enabling healing to begin to work because whether it's a, a spear to the gut through a violation of covenant or it's a, it's a little paper cut on the arm with a sharp word, both bring death eventually. Death by a thousand cuts is very possible. It happens to thousands and thousands of marriages in this valley every year. And so what forgiveness does is it heals over that cut 
and enables health in a relationship. Of course, the opposite of forgiveness is a critical and judgmental spirit, and that bears the fruit of contempt and, and bitterness. The last character virtue that my dad uses with the relationship triangle that activates the, the power of God in your life is the virtue of humility. And the fruit that humility bears in your life is the fruit of grace. Because God gives grace to the humble, but he opposes the proud. And so if you want the grace of God flowing into your life, you need to walk in the humility of Christ as, I, as spelled out in Philippians chapter 2. The opposite, of course, of humility is pride. And the fruit of pride in a relationship is manipulation and control. You're like, you know, how's that? Because whenever we're exercising pride, we're doing it for the sake of power and control and manipulation. We're never exercising pride for the sake of serving. We're never exercising pride for the sake of blessing. We're always exercising pride for the sake of taking. We want to control the situation, manipulate the other person, and get what we want. Two expressions of pride that my dad always articulates. The first is that of, 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 of arrogance. Really easy to see. Arrogant, haughty, loud, brash, boastful, stubborn. Easy to see. The other expression of pride not as easy to see is that of self-pity. Always a victim, Eeyore, things never go my way. I always have it so hard. Nobody has it hard as me. I'm always trying. They're never trying. It's the same root of pride expressed different ways, both same deadly results. Because self-pity is just as much a, a, a manipulation and control move as, as the loud guy. So if, if, if you're the big physical person in the relationship, you're the dude, and you want to control the situation, you go loud. If you're the wife, and, and, and maybe he's got you by 100 pounds, and you want to control the situation, you just go quiet. Arrogance and self-pity, both expressions of pride, and both must be mortified and put to death or none of this works because integrity requires humility. Because when you're wrong, you can either cover it up or you can go, hey, I was wrong. My bad. I, I, you're actually right on that one. And you, if you have the humility to acknowledge where you were wrong, you can maintain your integrity. Without humility, you always try to act like you're right and you'll have no integrity. Honoring other people requires humility in that you're okay when other people win and you like to lift and build people up. Pride says, I can't build them up. I might look bad. They might look better. I need to tear them down so I can prop myself up. You can't honor unless you have a heart of humility, and you'll never forgive anybody without humility because pride will say, no, no, no. They don't deserve it. How dare they? And then you'll be an unforgiving person. So the virtue that ties integrity, honor, and forgiveness together is the virtue of humility. Those four things. You want to activate the power of God in your life. You spend the next 30 years endeavoring to be a man or woman of integrity, a woman of honor, a woman of humility, a man of forgiveness. You'll get there. So what I want to do with our remaining time is I want to focus on the top portion of the triangle because that's the one I'm, I find people struggle with most. And so for our remaining time to end our series on the stronger marriage, I want to give you a short meditation on forgiveness. The reason is because you will be sinned against in your marriage. And if you don't have a mechanism in place by which to deal with that sin and pain, you will not have the ability to build a stronger marriage. A few misconceptions about forgiveness and why we don't do it. When I deal with couples in crisis counseling scenarios and I'm, and I'm hearing the wife or husband wrestle with forgiving them, I hear them say things that I understand to be true in how they feel, but they are not true in reality. And so I want to deal with these misconceptions because some of you here in this room have an unforgiving spirit toward your spouse, and you're not going to move forward in health until you can forgive them. And some of you here might be wounded by a person later in life, and if you haven't practiced the discipline and the grace of forgiveness, you will not be a person capable of building a stronger marriage. So a few misconceptions to clear up. Number one, forgiveness is not minimizing sin. I say that because the first impulse of forgiving someone can sometimes feel like we're just writing off their sin is not a big deal. Forgiveness is not saying nobody's perfect. 
It wasn't that big a deal. Whatever. No, no, no. Forgiveness goes the other way. Forgiveness says, no, sin is a big deal. In fact, sin is such a big deal that God had to send his son to be murdered on a cross to pay for the wage that your sin and my sin incurred on the universe. That's how big a deal sin is. So Christianity doesn't go there, oh, sin's not a big deal. No, Christianity goes the other way. Sin's a huge deal, and we forgive. Forgiveness is not minimizing sin. Secondly, forgiveness is not lacking anger. I've literally sat across the table. He, he, he's abused me for 10 years. He said he's sorry. He never stops. I want to forgive him and be godly, but I just feel myself being angry toward him. Is that okay? Totally, sweetheart, because God is. God's not up there indifferent to sin. If you can see sin or sin yourself or be sinned against or observe sin around you and not be bothered, something's broken. Sin should bother us. And we're not perfect, and we're not Jesus, I get it, but it is okay to be angry at sin. Forgiveness is not lacking anger. Three, forgiveness is not enabling sin. Well, he keeps asking for my forgiveness, so I keep forgiving him. And then I never confront him in his sin. Or, or the other way, she keeps asking me to forgive her. Or she doesn't ask me to forgive her. The, so this is the, the, the common error. Wives go along with their, with their husbands' sins of, of commission. And husbands go along with their, with their wives' sins of omission. That's what I see a lot. The husband keeps looking at porn. Or he keeps breaking his word. Or he keeps doing whatever. And she doesn't know what to do. He keeps making foolish decisions financially. Or he keeps bucking authority in his life, rejecting godly counsel. And she's like, well, I'm supposed to submit, so I don't know what to do. So I'll just forgive. And rather than helping him and confronting him and trying to, oh, she enables a sin. And that, that's not what, for, oh, he just, we're, we're, we're $60,000 in debt. We're $100,000 in debt. We're one hundred. One conversation, $120,000 in consumer debt. The wife found out the day before I met with him. That was a fun conversation. Combined household income of $47,000 a year. Her husband just dug a hole they have no prayer of getting out of. And what she's supposed to do in that moment? Well, we got to figure out a way to forgive him. But you can't keep enabling the sin either. So wives often enable... Husbands' sins of commission. Husbands often enable wives' sins of omission. He screwed up. She's angry at him. He asks for forgiveness. She says no. And then for 20 years refuses to forgive him. So her sin isn't what she's doing actively. Her sin is what she's refusing to do, which is to obey Jesus and forgive him. Forgiveness is not enabling sin. Forgiveness is not neglecting justice. One of the reasons that oftentimes it can be confusing with forgiveness is because we, we view forgiveness as synonymous with neglecting justice. You can forgive someone, call the cops, have them arrested, and testify against them in court. To forgive someone doesn't mean, well, consequences go away. No, no. There is always consequence for sin. If I, if I took a cookie off of the plate, then my wife has said, please don't take a cookie off that plate. I've made it for guests. And she comes back and she says, honey, it was a really big deal to me. I am sorry, honey. I screwed up. Would you forgive me? Yes, we're, we're, we're back, okay? The consequence for the taking the cookie off the plate is different than I've been texting an old high school girlfriend for a year without telling you. Okay, so there are varying consequences for sin, and sometimes there are legal consequences. I've broken this law or I've broken that law. You can forgive her or forgive him, and still the cops have them arrested and testify against them in court. Forgiveness is not neglecting justice. In Psalm 99, O Lord, you were a forgiving God to them and an avenger of their wrongdoings. Forgiveness is not absence of consequence for sin. Number five, forgiveness is not denying pain. This is important because if you have a sin committed against you and it causes pain, sometimes the Christian message can be like, hey, just get over it. He's abused me physically for 10 years. 
Yeah, just, 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 just. Really? It's not denying that pain was inflicted. They called you names in front of all the kids at school, and you're just supposed to pretend like they didn't happen? No, 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 no. Which leads me to the next misconception, and that is forgiveness is not forgetting. This is a huge misconception in, in, in the church, and it's, it's bad Bible teaching, it's bad pastoral counseling, and you don't see it with the small sins. He took the cookie from the plate. You should just forgive him and forget it. Okay, I can kind of see how you get there, and I can agree. But it doesn't translate as varying degrees of sins go down the line. And I'm going to use more extreme examples to make the point. Because pastors do this. You need to forgive and forget. Really? She was raped. You don't forget that. She was molested by her dad's brother for five years. And you're going to tell her to just forgive him and forget it? Are you kidding me? It's, it's not only unbiblical, it's irresponsible. Think about it. Like, like if you were to carry that out to its logical end, you have a babysitter over, they molest your kids, you find out about it, but you decide, I'm going to forgive and forget. And so you invite them over the next week. And I go, what are you doing? And you're like, what do you mean what am I doing? I'm like, I'm like, they abused your kids last week. Oh, I forgave them and forgot about it. What world do you live in? That doesn't happen. If you forgive and forget, you could put yourself or others in continued situations where harm will be done. That's not wise and loving. That's foolish and stupid. It's impossible to forgive and forget. Forgetting can become a fruit of forgiving but not a prerequisite and not a requirement of forgiving. I mean, if you make a habit of forgiving someone of their sin eventually, like, like, like one husband, I'm getting ahead in my, in, in my notes, one husband said, my wife cheated on me and I forgave her. And every time I saw her with a dude talking uh, in the church lobby the next five years, I thought, is that the next one? Are you supposed to just forget it? She was humble. She was broken. She was repentant. She was walking in purity and holiness and and his forgiveness of her gave her an opportunity to establish a new track record of faithfulness. And over time, I said, bro, every time you, see you have that, you have to forgive her again. Because forgiveness is not a one-time event. You forgive her again. You forgive her again. You forgive. And eventually, when he practiced forgiving her, the fruit of it was eventually forgetting. Because it wasn't... The, the, the dominant thought was, I'm going to interact with you based on your sin. Now, now some of you are stuck here, and I'm skimming over this. You're like, well, what about, isn't there a verse? And you're arguing with me. You don't know your Bible well enough. But you're like, isn't there a verse somewhere about something? Let me help you make your case. Isaiah 43, 25. I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will remember your sins no more. You're like, oh, yeah, see, there it is. What you fail to acknowledge is that forgetting someone's sins is categorically different than choosing not to remember someone's sins. When God says, I choose not to remember your sins, what he is saying is that he is actively working not to raise the matter. To forget it may become a passive function of fading memory. The first is forgiveness. The second is the result of forgiveness. So when you forgive a spouse... You're promising not to raise the matter again. When God forgives us in Christ, he's choosing not to interact with us based on our past sin, but the present and future work of Christ covering our sin. But the infinite, eternal, outside of time God doesn't forget about my sin. He chooses to interact with me based on the finished work of Christ. Two different things. Not a one-time event, not forgetting. Uh, forgiveness is not trust restored, meaning trust is gained slowly, broken quickly. If someone breaks trust, it's not responsible nor helpful for them to give them the same measure of trust before they broke your trust. The, the, the grace that you extend them is the opportunity to rebuild trust over time. Not that you're holding it over their heads, but that you're granting them the opportunity to act in such a way as to rebuild your trust. To forgive and then trust 
is foolish. So forgiveness doesn't mean reconciliation. Forgiveness means I'm choosing not to let your sin hurt me anymore. Because when you have an unforgiving spirit, you're, you're reliving that sin over and over every day as if it just happened. So someone sins against you, and 10 years later, you're still thinking about it and stewing on it. Here's what's happening physiologically, mentally, emotionally, physiologically. Your body, body is firing up in, resp in response to the images in your mind or the, or the video that you're playing in your mind of the situation. And though it happened 10 years ago, your body is responding like it happened 10 seconds ago. And that you're carrying that now in your body, which is why unforgiving people are unhealthy emotionally, relationally. So you can't be a healthy person if you refuse to forgive. When you forgive, you say, I'm giving the past over to the Lord and I'm freeing myself in the present to move joyfully into the future, freed from that event of the past. Lastly, forgiveness is not a response to repentance. Meaning, you do not have to wait for the other person to ask your forgiveness in order to give it. And this is where our forgiveness of humans is different from our forgiveness from the Father. I say this because if you think, and this is very common in Christian circles, if you think, well, I can't forgive them because they haven't asked, that's not you living up to the biblical code and transaction of forgiveness. That's you using a loophole to get off obeying Jesus. When we sin against someone else, the, the, the command of God is to repent and to seek forgiveness. When someone repents and asks for forgiveness, the command of God is to grant repentance or forgiveness. If you're withholding forgiveness from someone because they haven't asked, this is what you're doing. I'm using their disobedience to Jesus to justify my disobedience to Jesus. Because God's command to you is to forgive. You say, but I'm letting them off the hook. You're not letting them off the hook. You're letting them off your hook and putting them on God's hook so you can be free and he can be God. You say, where's that in the Bible? I've already referenced it. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That was not in response to a Roman soldier going, my gosh, Jesus, I'm so sorry. Sorry about the punctured lung there and the, and, and the nails to the hands and feet. Would you please forgive me? You bet. Let's do this. No, no. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Refusing to forgive other people is drinking poison, waiting for the other person to die. It only hurts you. So what is forgiveness? Quickly, forgiveness is three things. Choosing not to hold someone's debt against them. Forgiveness is number two, letting God be the one who deals with the debt. Forgiveness is number three, a one-time decision and an ongoing process. Number four, forgiveness is praying for the offender's blessing. You're like, how do I know if I've forgiven that person? Do you pray for them? Uh, regularly, you're there. As opposed to, how do I know if I've forgiven them? Do you, do you pray for them? I, I would never pray for them. Okay, we've got work to do. Pray for your enemies. Bless those who curse you. If, you're hunt, if your enemy is hungry, fix him a sandwich when he gets home from work. <laughs> if your enemy is thirsty, give her something to drink at the end of a long Saturday. Forgiveness is, is not merely a work of, okay, I'll let them off the hook, is an active step of, Father, would you work in their life in such a way as to bring about true repentance so they might know you and the freedom that you bring? So why doesn't Satan want you to forgive? We'll end with this. Satan doesn't want you to forgive because if you forgive, you'll pull heaven into your relationships. See, when you, whenever you're, and, and there, I know for a fact, statistically proven, there are humans in the room. So there are people in the room right now who wrestle with unforgiveness or are currently in a position where they are withholding forgiveness from someone. And I'm telling you, you're hurting you, not them. And you're on Satan's team currently because Satan is cheering on your unforgiveness. If you're a wife withholding forgiveness for your husband, Satan's going, yeah, go girl. 
I love it when they run my play in their marriage. Go to Grace today, that's fine. Just don't forgive your husband and we'll be good. Satan cheers on the unforgiver because the unforgiver is actively pulling hell up into their life. Satan doesn't want you to forgive because Satan loves it, number one, when you play God. This is great. She thinks she can get, it, get back at him, and she thinks that she can, ooh, this is good. I like this. I love it when wives play God. I love it when husbands play God. This is good. This is good. Satan loves it when you withhold forgiveness because Satan loves when you diminish the cross. Listen to how one pastor put it. The power that frees us from holding grudges is that in the cross of Christ, God satisfied his grudge against us and dropped it. So Paul says, forgive us, God in Christ forgave you. When you hold a grudge, you cancel out the cross. We act as though God did a foolish thing on the cross since he dropped his infinite grudge against us, but we are going to hold our little grudge against so-and-so, and thus Satan brings the cross of Christ into contempt. Satan loves it when you withhold forgiveness because you play God, you diminish the cross of Christ, you breed division in your marriage, your family, your church, your school, your community, you crush a repentant sinner. Second Corinthians, Paul's like, hey, he asked for forgiveness. Now love him lest he be crushed by your relational withholding of affirmation. Wives, real time in this church, there are wives who are crushing husbands for sins they committed 17, 18, 19, 20 years ago. They can't ask for forgiveness anymore. You just have to grant it, sweetheart. That, that, that he may continue growing in health, you'll stay stuck and poisoned by your own unwillingness to deal with the tumor that you've chosen to keep in, in your chest. The tumor of toxicity and unforgiveness and bitterness. And until you say, I give him to God, I give his judgment to the hand of God, and I forgive him. And then the irony is, you're the one torpedoing the relationship and you keep blaming him. Or vice versa. Lastly, Satan loves it when you withhold forgiveness because you do his job for him by destroying yourself with bitterness. Listen to how Spurgeon put it. We'll end with this. To be forgiven is such sweetness that honey is tasteless in comparison with it. But yet there is one thing sweeter still, and that is to forgive. As it is more blessed to give than receive, so too forgiveness rises a stage higher in experience than to be forgiven. So here's my question. Are you forgiven? Because forgiven people forgive people. And if you're wrestling with forgiving people, the root cause of that is you're not experiencing true forgiveness yourself. Those who have experienced the forgiveness of God are so overwhelmed with all they have been set free from that it's hard for them to keep lists of other people's sins. When you're overwhelmed with your own sin, it's hard to play you know, the binocular game or the magnifying game with other people's sin. When you lose sight of what you've been forgiven of, then all of a sudden all you can see is everything else that people have done wrong. It's forgiven people who are most easily equipped to forgive because they're simply drawing from what they've received in, in Christ from the Father. So if you struggle with forgiveness, I'm suggesting you should consider whether or not you've experienced the forgiveness of the Father. It's like this. I was with a wife a while back, and her husband kept complimenting her, and she's like, gets all embarrassed. Oh, ho, ho, ho. And it was the simplest thing. So she's a great cook, or her hair looks so nice, or she's so great at the kids. And she just couldn't receive a compliment. And finally, I was like, do you not receive compliments? Well, oh, no, I hate them. Why? I don't know. Do you think you don't deserve them? No, I totally don't deserve them. Interesting. Have you received forgiveness from the Father for the sins of your past, present, and future? so that you'll be presented as spotless and holy and blameless before him, covered in the righteous robes of Christ? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, then you can receive your husband telling his friends you make a good casserole. That's weird, right? Unless you haven't. I said, you should consider if you have truly received 
the affirmation from the Father through Christ, because if it did, it would open up a capacity in your heart to receive affirmation from your husband. So too with this forgiveness. If you're struggling with a small output of forgiveness, boop, 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 it may be because the valve receiving the downflow of a load of heaven has been closed off. So do you have God's power? <laughs> First Corinthians, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is to us who are being saved, the power of God. What do you need in your life more than a podcast? You need the power of God. I mean, keep listening to our podcast and sharing them because it's awesome. It's getting out there. So keep doing that, right? right? But what I'm saying is our podcast hopefully served to toint, point to toint. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> going to say turn and point to toint, to toint you, <laughs> to turn you to and point you towards the power of God. Get that out. Fourth sermon, a little tired here. I didn't get to this in either sermons. I'm going to hold you just two minutes longer because fourth service gets a good special thing here. I have a picture of what your marriage could look like. There's two different ways that marriages can, can grow strong and bear fruit. One is you plant them right from the beginning. And some of you, that's your, that's your young marriage in here. You're two, three, four, five years in. It's all fun. It's incredible. And you've been working this stuff. With them. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And this is what your marriage will look like. Little twigs going into the, into the dirt. And that little twig will one day become a beautiful fruit-bearing tree. I took that picture two weeks ago. 100 yards down the road from our house, an orchard who's replanting an orchard, starting from scratch. Pull it all up, start over. And in, in, in two weeks' time, that orchard's looking like this. Look at that. It's, it's already coming. New life, green, growing fast, growing straight, going right. It's awesome. Across the street, there's another orchard that's being replanted and looks like this. They cut every tree off a foot and a half above the ground. So the entire orchard is now stumps. And I, th I, th I thought, what are they doing? They're, they're tearing the orchard out. But they didn't tear the stumps out. And then a few weeks later, I drove by, and I saw these little guys. Huh. That's weird. They duct taped some twigs <laughs> to the top of a stump and painted it yellow. What does it mean? And so, so I'm watching a farmer farm new orchards. One... He plants a new tree, and it grows right from the get-go. The other, he cuts everything down and starts over with what's above the ground. And so I'm watching. like They're doing that with all the trees, and pretty soon the whole thing has it. And then I realize just beyond where he's doing this, there's another bank of orchard that's a little further along. So I walk down there, and guess what? Those little stubs start growing. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. He's grafting an entirely new kind of tree onto the old stump. This is blowing my mind. So I call my farmer friends. I'm like, what is going on over there? And they're like, buckle up. And they start telling me all this crazy stuff. The old orchard had a virus or a bug or the variety wasn't you know, in anymore and the market got soft for it. So you can cut the whole orchard out, leave the root system, and then, and then, and then you graft a new kind of tree and you can bear different kind of fruit, but it takes time. So now there's a whole orchard with this new grafted thing going on. And I'm walking through going, I, 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 it's so dumb. I cried the craziest things. I'm walking in an orchard crying. I'm like, there's hope for marriages in Grace City. Look, look. There, there's hope for stronger marriages in Grace City. Picture, picture, picture. This is awesome. Don't tear up the root ball. Don't mess with the covenant. Leave the covenant there. And cut everything else out. Like that, you may have to do that. It's like literally, what can we keep? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> but leave the root ball of the covenant. Don't pull the covenant up or the tree will die. Leave the covenant, graft a new marriage. That can happen in your marriage. Some of you, you got planted right out of the gate on the money. Awesome. Right brand, right root stock, right tree. Grow tall, man. Some of you may need to go cut some things down. Maybe just a branch, maybe, maybe a hard pruning, or maybe the whole thing. I've done 
marriage ceremonies in this church, in that chapel, where it's like, you know what? The foundation was off. The covenant's in place. Christ was never there. There's nothing redeemable in the last 20 years. We're going to cut it down. Can we reboot and start over with a renewal of our covenant vows? Absolutely. And look what happens over time. Just beyond this orchard block is another orchard. I've lived across it for eight years. It grows beautiful cherries, huge green. And I thought, I wonder, I walked down to that big mature orchard block. And when I dug through the branches and walked in, guess what I found at the bottom of those beautiful trees? That same thing had happened to that big, beautiful orchard. I thought I'd been there all along. But had, at one point, had got, had got cut down to start over to graft a new kind of tree, to bear a different kind of fruit. And so what I'm telling you is, that's a newly grafted, that's a, a, a grafted tree that's 15 years in, doing this massively productive new orchard. So you may feel like this today, but you can be like that in five years. Just give the Lord and his promises some time. Because you can trust in the promises of God, and they will not return void. Can I read a prayer over you? And we'll be done. Why don't you stand and receive this as our benediction for our Stronger Marriage series. If you got a spouse, hold their hand. Put their arm around them. Just don't make out until I'm done. <laughs> for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray out of his glorious riches, that he may strengthen you with his power through his Holy Spirit in your inner being that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of of the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more than you could ask or imagine according to his power at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And now Father we pray that you would engage with us by your Spirit in our inner being, your power, that we would choose to walk in the power of the Spirit of Christ, that we would engage the law of power, Christ in us, and that you would, where there are new orchards growing, water, fertilize, strengthen, and where there are some old orchards getting hacked down, you would graft a new relationship to bear new fruit. And Father, I pray that it wouldn't take 10 years for new fruit to bear. It, it, would, it would happen tomorrow. They would see, oh, there's hope. There's hope for this to be new. Lord, the, at the foundation of the family capital of the world would be stronger marriages made up of stronger men, loving, noble women, raising happy kids to show the world that not only the truth, but the goodness and the beauty of the way of the master and his plan. We love you, Father. May marriage be held in honor among all at Grace City Church. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, everyone. Pastor Josh here. Hope that served you well. One of our passions at Strong Man Nation is to help you build a stronger marriage. To that end, a bunch of you have been sending in questions on marriage that my wife and I tackle in our Stronger Marriage podcast. You could check out right here.